And it's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Associate Professor Peter Barty. He's a clinical haematologist, but more than that, he's one of the leaders in the sector. He's held a range of executive positions. He holds, he's a key advisor and player with the blood service. And as I said initially, he's a leader in relation to blood. Since returning to Adelaide in 1987... 97. 97. <coughs> 87, I was still at high school. You're absolutely right. <laughs> Since 2005, he has held leadership roles in the public health sector. He's been the medical head of the Division of Medicine at TQEH, the Chief Medical Officer in Central Northern Adelaide Health Service, the Chair of the South Australian Clinical Senate, the Interim Clinical Director of Cancer Centre Royal Adelaide Hospital since October 2010, and recently appointed Clinical Director of Cancer Services in Central Adelaide Local Health Network. He also chairs the State Blood Management Council. Please join me in welcoming Peter. All of those titles with different institutions and governance entities will be a concept I'll come back to later on. Um, and you'll, you'll need to excuse me a little bit because one of the reasons I became a physician was that I used to faint in theatre. Um, I fainted at... A, mastectomy, I fainted at a caesarean, I, in fact I fainted everything. They wanted me to go into the um, uh, Burns Theatre during the Ash Wednesday bushfires. In my first year of physician training I walked in and fainted. So Daryl slides. <laughs> I must be the only haematologist in the world who can't stand the sight of blood unless it's, <laughs> unless it's in a bag and preferably in the blood bank. So, with that in mind, if I have to sort of stop halfway through and go and throw up, it's because of those slides of yours, Daryl. I almost had to tell you to stop. Um, okay, so the, a couple of things. People who know... Can, actually, how many people know me? Don't answer that question. How many people are from South Australia? So, we do have a few people from interstate. This is a very South Australian-focused talk. People who know me know that I tend to ramble a bit, but also know that I tend to be provocative. I apologise for rambling, but I'm not going to apologise for being provocative because I think there are lots of provocative issues in this area around our ability to establish governance that's robust and I'll be raising them um, as we go along. The first provocative thing is I changed the title of the talk. Um, the... Um, so that was the title that was given to me and I've changed it to Establishing Governance for Patient Blood Management because for too long this has been about governance around transfusion and, you know, frankly, we've got our act together in terms of that. The blood sector is, provides an extraordinarily safe product as we've seen from Daryl's slides. Most of the systems for getting the product out of the blood bank and into patients are pretty tight. So this is a lot of that has been developed over the years and you can picture the scenarios that led to the dramatic improvements, the HIV um, epidemic and those sorts of things. What we're moving towards now then is extending this governance process well beyond just the governance around the product. And that's why I think every time we think about this, we need to think about patient. And I think the whoever asked that question about the consumer before is spot on. This is about governance to improve patient outcomes in the context of the use of blood and blood products as a potential part of their therapy. Okay, so sorry, changed the title. Um, what I thought I'd do is go through the various governance entities that have been developed in South Australia over the last couple of years. And I don't want to leave you with the sense that this is all cooked and fixed and together because it's in a state of evolution. This entity, which is, as you can see at the top, is the peak advisory body on the blood sector, on blood sector matters in South Australia, has been in existence for two years. And it's, there were a number of governance entities prior to that, um, but the Blood Management Council came in existence uh, just over two years ago. The driver for that 
came from the department. So that's the central peak governance body in the state. And this was very much driven by Stephen Chrisley, who's one of the beautiful people sitting in the front row. Um, the, sorry, somebody else said all the beautiful people sitting in the front row. You were about, <laughs> um, so concept number one, and there'll be some principles around this that'll come through the talk as we go on, but concept and principle number one is that this needs to be driven from the top. And I'll come back to the fact that I think we've lost senior leadership at, number, at a number of the levels below the very top, partly, I think, because this area wasn't sexy, wasn't really that dangerous, and a lot of people out there are not paying for the product. So, you know, I'm worried about my budget. What the hell are you harassing me about this for? That sort of concept. So driving this from the people in the department, establishing this council has been a fundamental process. So this is statewide. As you'll see, it reports up to the highest level um, in the Department of Health um, to a group that uh, the uh, Chief Executive sits on. I've got a couple of the, um, the dot points from the terms of reference there. The details aren't, of all of them, are, are not critical for this talk, but providing statewide governance oversight and direction to the blood sector programs, acting as a steering group for statewide projects, proposals, including consideration of revised, revised methods of provision of service. One of the key challenges for us in all of these governance processes is to attract the surgeons who are not interested. Now, you know, Daryl jokes about the fact there aren't any surgeons here. Are there any general physicians? Oh, Paddy. Sorry, I forgot Paddy Phillips was a general physician, but he's actually um, the chief medical officer of the state. So I imagine he's here in that capacity rather than as a physician. So what... OK. I'm digging myself a hole. I'll move on from that concept. <laughs> the other physicians are here, I imagine, are all hematologists. Oh, it's part, this is part of our core business. So we struggle to get interest beyond the core people who are interested. And, and, and one of the key principles is for us to develop ways through our governance processes of attracting the various other clinicians, both medical and nursing, to adopt the sort of practices that Daryl was talking about. OK, Blood Management Council at the top. And this is the membership. Um, so, senior health sector executive, um, that's got to be someone old, grey, who's been around. Um, so, that's me at the moment. Um, and the other appointee from the department is the manager of the blood and organ and tissue program. The council includes clinicians from the following specialties. And this is the sort of second concept. There are a few people in each of these specialties who are interested. And one of the dilemmas is that um, having, they end up being asked to be involved all the time. And we need to develop governance that sees us use them optimally, not overuse them and get them to be out there attracting other people as well. The, um, the other areas that are involved in the council are we've got um, representation from country, which doesn't appear on this slide, and in particular a general practitioner from the country who plays a very important role. The Blood Safe program, and there are similar entities around the country, um, is absolutely critical to the council, and I'll come back to this later in terms of the fact that a lot of energy and resource for what we can do comes from this group, and there are blood safe representatives. Then there are nominees from the patient blood management committees from around the state. So these are the old transfusion committees, the majority have been renamed patient blood management committees, and we also have a representative from the private sector sitting around that. And the other important thing is that none of this stuff happens unless it's supported, and um, there is project there's a project and administrative secretariat. So as I said, it reports to the highest level in the department and that's fundamental and critical. 
When, um, soon after we established, or the council was established, we went through a strategic planning process where we tried to identify key initiative areas for us to direct energies towards. And that's led to a couple of subcommittees that are now, after a year, 18 months, starting to generate some energy around two areas. The first is a group that we've called trans, uh, the group translating evidence into practice. And this group is looking at issues like, um, there's been the recent publication around um, transfusion in upper GI bleeding and evidence that liberal transfusion patients do worse than if they have a more conservative transfusion strategy, similar to the sort of concepts that have been in ICUs for a number of years. How do you take that concept and see it into practice across a large jurisdiction um, like we have. So this group, the Translating Evidence into Practice group, is looking at those sorts of areas and developing strategies to see implementation of improved practice. The second is a research uh, committee. Just realised committee's only got one in there. Um, the research committee is looking at research areas, so there are big gaps in our knowledge about optimal practice in this area. Can we improve our understanding and see practice change based on evidence? And we've got a group that's looking at that as well. And in time, other subcommittees will be developed. And this is a way of drawing in other individuals who don't want to sit around, you know, at committee meetings, getting bored, stupid, they want to do stuff, a bit like surgeons rather than physicians. Um, okay, so that's the top of the governance hierarchy. At the other end, down at the coalface, is an entity that is absolutely critical, and this is the site-based patient blood management subcommittees. Now, I've called them subcommittees, and now I'm moving towards the structures that we have in the central Adelaide LHN. There was a drive as we underwent the fifth or sixth reiteration of governance changes on this side of town to establish a single transfusion committee or patient blood management committee across the two sites that sit within the central area. And we've resisted that, arguing that having energy at the coalface is absolutely fundamental. This is the group that knows what's going on on the ground in the hospitals and as such, and it's also the group that it's easier to get people to engage with. So the site-based committees, and this is an example of membership um, of the uh, site-based committees in the central area where we have two, one at the Queen Elizabeth and one at the Royal Adelaide. So there's a chairperson who's actually elected by the committee rather than appointed from above representatives from high use areas, representatives from the um, pathology provider who's providing the majority of the blood, or all of the blood products into our public hospitals. Once again, the Blood Safe program appears. And importantly, the site-based committee reports to an oversight group that sits within this newly established network. And just a quick uh, comment about that oversight group is that we've decided we want the clinicians down contributing at the site-based committee. This oversight group can have representation from those site-based committees, but as you can see, it's a different sort of representation, and this is about oversight, monitoring, reporting up. And this entity reports um, straight to, well, reports to the uh, CEO of the central LHN um, as well as reporting into the state uh, blood management council. Okay. This is basically the, the diagrammatic representation of what I've just said. Patients, staff, coalface at the bottom, the site-based committees reporting up to a network patient blood management committee which reports to the network CEO and to the South Australian Blood Management Council and then further up to the chief executive. So 
the importance about the arrangements here are that there is clarity for everybody through this hierarchy about what their role is. The nurse administering a transfusion knows, this is theoretically, should know what happens if she reports a problem and what the process will be and what, that, what she, she or he can expect in terms of um, feedback about issues that relate to a concern that they may well have addressed. So that's the nature of the current governance. Getting engagement at the network level, in my experience in recent years, has been very challenging and I think that's because at the network level, the interest is in money and we're not paying for this stuff at the moment. So, you know, so what's the problem? It's pretty safe. I've got other issues. Nobody's verbalised that, but it's been very difficult to get engagement that talks to enthusiasm to drive this area. That's why the drive from the department has been so critical. Okay, so a few principles, and these are probably the most important concepts. So the first thing is this concept of senior statewide executive sponsorship. The second is engagement with key clinical user groups and using them where you can engage them. Don't appoint an anaesthetist to a committee when you know they're never going to turn up, or a surgeon, or a general physician. Um, find out how you can engage them and develop some processes that draw their expertise in. Accurate data is critical and I'll show some examples of some of the things that have been done in this state very briefly that are using data to inform changes in practice. I've emphasised a number of times the importance of the site-based governance entities. Don't take stuff away from where people care and stick it in a hierarchical structure that they don't relate to. A bad idea. The Blood Safe program has been integral in this state to developing a number of things that um, a, a lot of initiatives are now based on. I'll show you some examples. Facilitating translation of evidence into practice. This is a new concept in this area. How do we do that through these governance processes? And I hope I've given you some idea of how we're trying to do that. And clearly moving beyond this being about transfusion. This is about transfusion, yes, but it's about a whole lot more than simply transfusion. Okay, I just wanted to give you some idea of the fact that you need people doing stuff to support these activities. It's okay to have your hierarchy and your reporting lines, but if you're seriously trying to monitor, if you're seriously trying to change practice, you need people on the ground who have an interest and are there to drive the process. And these are some of the things that have evolved out of BloodSafe and I need to thank Sue Island for these, for some of the slides that are about to come. So the BloodSafe program in this state, which started about 12 years ago, developed procedures, education, training, I'll show you an example, number of resources. BloodSafe nurses are the ones doing the bedside observational audits, interpreting developing plans to deal with areas of problem problems. We've just had an issue in the central area where uh, around about 30% of checking procedures were not being followed as per appropriate guidelines. Once upon a time, we couldn't get anybody interested in that. The fact that the standards now require us to have evidence of how we deal with this has led everybody to implement things close to overnight as soon as they became aware of them. And they play a critical role in incident monitoring. Who's doing your incident monitoring? If you don't have somebody doing your incident monitoring and having defining loops to deal with problems that, sorry, loop closure, why report stuff? Blood safe nurses have been fundamental in that regard. I think you're familiar with the BloodSafe e-learning um, resources that have been um, developed out of the BloodSafe program and I think are now used around the country. This is uh, the um, 
transfusion resource and uh, you may well more recently have seen the iron deficiency e-learning which is an extraordinary resource for doctors, nurses, um, students. Um, Bloodsafe's developed that. Data to inform practice, to identify problem areas, um, to allow the implementation of new approaches that are evidence-based. This is an example of um, transfusion rates related to different surgical procedures um, and haematological variables, um, MCV and MCH in particular. So this data, which is accrued centrally through a process that's locally called data linkage, reported back to clinician groups and then in the context of the governance processes that I've described, allows the system to ask questions about is there a problem, can we start looking at it, can we help you to improve practice? And this has also been a way of increasing the understanding of the importance of this area um, out there amongst those who are not so familiar. Another blood safe initiative, this is around uh, pre-operative assessment that Daryl was talking about um, and a number of resources out there around um, managing iron deficiency. I'm not sure whether other jurisdictions, when I say jurisdictions, other states um, by and large manage iron deficiency as badly as it's managed across um, the spectrum of the uh, health system as it is in South Australia, but it's pretty poor. Um, we've, you know, the, the recurrent theme of a woman in particular who's been anaemic for 15 years and people have taught her to sort of get on with it um, and the GP's been giving her intramuscular iron on and off and she's had a haemoglobin of, you know, 90 to 100 all of that period of time and then turns up finally to have an iron infusion and... I used to love looking after malignant haematology. Now I like looking after iron deficiency because um, the smiles are uh, are awesome. So all of these resources, these sorts of resources, once again being developed by Bloodsafe. Who in your system is helping you do this sort of stuff? We're lucky that we've got Bloodsafe, albeit it's not a huge. They're not a huge number of people, and we'd love more. Okay, and it, this just talks to a number of, um, of the quality improvement activities that are being driven through the governance process that I've said, um, pre-operative um, assessment of patients to uh, optimise haemoglobin um, prior to surgery, iron deficiency in obstetrics, trying to improve the access to IV iron, there are a couple of projects looking at minimising iatrogenic um, blood loss by decreasing sample size. And on the other hand, um, cell salvage and the optimisation of uh, coagulation status in the context of particular forms of surgery. Initiatives that previously were being driven by enthusiasts at small groups, the governance process I've described is drawing this together giving us a bigger voice and hopefully seeing further improvement in practice. Okay, so I just want to finish off with the last slide, which are these principles, senior executive sponsorship, really engaging with clinical users, accurate data that's shared and shared in an open way, the importance of site-based governance entities, together with the other governance structures. I don't know what we... Very little of what we've done in this state would exist without Bloodsafe. Um, and those last two points as well. And I think the last slide's actually an acknowledgement slide for the people who've driven this process. Um, Stephen Chrisley um, from the department. Um, Sue Ireland, who's been involved in this area for... I think, what did I say, I was in primary school in 1987, I think, um, 
I think Sue was here involved in something to do with blood management back then. The, um, um, Sue and her team, and prior to her, Brendan Carney, or Brendan Carney was uh, very integral in getting the Blood Safe program up and running. Catherine Robinson, who many of you know, has been uh, an enthusiast, extraordinar extraordinarily energetic, and I've misspelled her first name, um, and um, a lot of what I've described has, uh, has only really occurred because of her enthusiasm as well. And then Barb Parker, who I don't think is here, and the other blood safe nurses who we have in town. So I just want to acknowledge all of those people as the key drivers. And I think my time is up. Questions, comments? Oh, thanks, Peter. Um, my interest is in managing intravenous immunoglobulin. And um, the, um, this uh, governance and the um, council, uh, you've said that they're interested in research. I was wondering, do you think the council would be interested in um, looking at clinical outcomes of um, IVIG treatments, particularly for autoimmune diseases that use large uh, volumes of immunoglobulin? As a, um, as a way of trying to um, understand what dosing is required and what clinical outcomes to expect? I think the management of IVIG has been unique in the blood area in that it's been in place and evidence-based for a lot longer than the majority of other stuff. Um, and because of that, I think we've kind of left it by and large to the IVIG user groups who you know, who you work with and Bob Heddle's group who you work with. Having said that, I think we would be interested in trying to facilitate um, what you describe. Um, but I think it's probably one of the areas that's better managed than most of the others. So in terms of prioritisation. How many blood safe nurses have we got, Sue? Mm. And we've got you. Um, and that's one of the problems, it's resource. I'm not sure if that was the right answer from uh, the blood sector people, but that would be my perspective. I can uh, just offer, and this is breaking news from the Jurisdictional Blood Committee, there is a, there is a um, or the Jurisdictional Blood Committee, which are representatives from all states, state, territory, and the Commonwealth Government, approved a project, a range of pro projects to the value of about four and a half million dollars. Be a new database, um, new governance arrangements that is funding for the governance arrangements with the, uh, with the intent of increasing um, the veracity of the current criteria, but also there's an R&D element to that as well. So it's not, it, there will be obviously flow ons to the state. I'm not in a position to comment on how that might look. You might, do you want to comment, Stephen? of IVIG in South Australia is as good as anywhere. I think it's, it's very good. But, but I think what we lack is the sort of senior clinical coming together nationally around, you know, where we go with the criteria, where we go with value for money and how we learn because the evidence base for IVIG is a bit, you know, it's a bit hard sometimes because it doesn't, you know, the indications don't go through the same process as they do for other things. So what I think, what, what the aim of the database is, is to enable better information about outcomes to be understood nationally and perhaps we can get a, a grasp over some of the research questions that I think clinicians in the area are really interested in. Yeah, there's a lot of interest now on clinical outcomes, particularly in South Australia with rheumatology and neurological patients. So um, it's an interesting area and one that I think we could, um, you know, manage dosing a lot better. Mm. Sure um, you are. As a, uh, a follow on, as part of that system, there will be clinical specialty groups that will feed up, so those issues should be fed into those new arrangements. But importantly, the local governance needs to stay strong. We cannot feed as strong as where it starts from the coal base. Yeah. Yeah. And um, Peter, one question that certainly I had is throughout the symposiums, one of the issues that have been raised, and you raised it as a key point in terms of executive support yes. and leadership. 
If it's not there, how do you get it? And you might want to first comment, obviously South Australia does have robust sort of top-down arrangements, but you might want to generally comment on how, how do you get that engagement if you, you haven't got it? Well, gee, how much time have we got? I, you know, I think the big challenge in this state is, and this is going to start getting provocative, has been that we've had, I don't know, what did I say previously, how many governance changes have we had in the last six years? I've had six CEOs, I think. Um, how do you engage an entity, a governance entity, that is changing every 18 months? Um, and that's scary because, I mean, the standards are going to help this because whoever comes into the seat is now confronted by this stuff and they've got to think about it. It's, it ends up becoming part of their agenda. But it, it is a real problem and I think it's been a problem for the reason I alluded to. This is a pretty safe area. I mean, what, what, the percentage of patients who have um, a mistake during their care in the public health system is, what, 15 to 20 per cent? Is that the figure that's been quoted over the years? Not in blood, 12 per cent. So in the blood area, it's dramatically low. So if you're the CEO, what are you going to be worried about? You're going to be worried about the, you know, the wrong leg operated on or the, you know, the patient who jumps out of bed and dies from a fall? Or are you going to be worried about an entity they believe is pretty safe? I mean, this is my personal view. Um, and I think it's because it's been made so safe by all of the entities driven through the blood service over the years. Um, and getting engagement about, well, you know, why aren't we giving these people iron tablets instead of transfusing them? That sort of stuff is at a different level. And I, I think it's a huge challenge. And I think the, the, the other problem we have in, in this jurisdiction is stuff might come out of the department, but the CEO who's got the budget is the person who's going to allocate that and prioritise it. And, you know, whether they're being driven by what's coming from above or their sort of financial agendas is, is an issue. If, could I make one comment? Peter? Sorry to butt in a few times. No, no, but, that's all right. But I, I think you're spot on about accreditation as being a really vital tool. I think the other exciting thing that's starting to happen nationally is there's a joint project between IPA, the Independent Hospital Pricing Authority, and the, the Commission for Safety and Quality that's looking at, you know, really what are the financial incentives for focusing on quality and I guess at the moment they've moved away from what are the financial incentives to start to look at what do we know and what do we understand and some of the preliminary data looks at what we get through the administrative systems about what's called the hospital acquired diagnoses, um, CHADEX and if you look at that and you translate that back to length of stay which is something that people who are worried about money are worried about, there's an obvious link between that and safety and quality but people don't necessarily draw the link. But that shows, I think it's about number nine in the list, coming just after constipation, is, uh, is uh, <laughs> uh, the, the length of stay impact of acquired anaemia, like hospital acquired anaemia. Yeah. So, you know, th there will be a focus, I think, through this, this increasing look at what happens to people in hospital in terms of quality of outcome that will drive it back into the governance process through another angle. And, and I suppose the, uh, the other point to make there is this issue of data. Having good data, that can drive evidence-based change is, is just fundamental. And getting the system to support accruing that data, 4.5 blood safe nurses in the whole state, and that's about it in terms of driving this stuff. So it's a resource allocation issue at that level as well. Um, unfortunately, we're going to have to bring it to a close there. Uh, Certainly a great overview of, uh, in particular, governance in South Australia, which is the first criteria for the standard. Um, thank you very much, Peter, on behalf of everyone here. And... Uh, is it red? It's not actually, there's no liquid in it. It's oh, actually, no. you've got to find your own liquid to put in well, it. But on behalf of everyone, thank you very much, Peter. <laughs>